Okay. All right, guys. Sorry, I woke up pretty late uh, this morning. I uh, I was up really late last night uh, working on one stuff. I just became obsessed with adding stuff to the OneNote, uh, and just it. I made your new homework assignment, uh, and that kind of prompted me adding a bunch of stuff because I was thinking about how you would you would react to this stuff, and I was trying to think more big picture and things like that. So I guess I can show you the homework first. And actually, if you're familiar, by now you're probably familiar with this, but if you go to homework and you go to links to homework, all right, uh, and you go to homework two, there's a bunch of uh, stuff here. Oh, whoa. Okay. There's question files in, in, in the form of PDFs where you can kind of see your homework to a PDF. Uh, rhythmic dictation, et cetera. We'll get back to that in a moment. But there's also files where you have part one and part two of the Sibelius file. In case you guys downloaded that educational copy of Sibelius, there's also Sibelius 8 files and music XML files. And this is, uh, this took some time, I mean, this took a little bit of time to export all this because uh, not surprisingly, I found some homework on my, uh, sorry, I found some error on my homework. Homework, sorry, it's early still for me. I'm still waking up. And when I do find error, I have to export everything for all those formats all over again. So, but it's all there and it should be correct. And uh, the dictation is here as well. There's dictation and there's uh, slower dictation file. So I guess you can get a chance to listen to this dictation. Let's listen to this. Let's see if it listens. Let's see if it plays back. You guys hear that? Yeah. Okay. You know, so that's the slower version. Let's hear the faster version. Okay, very good. Uh, Nicole. Yeah. I was having um. So you you also linked uh new score files, right? Sure. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure that you like tried to, uh, you did it all on your uh, Sibelius, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I did. Um, well, the format turned out a little bit weird for MuseScore, you know? Yeah. So uh, I, I, I was just like, I was just noticing that like, it was a little bit hard to. Uh, yeah. I I know what you mean. I, I did uh, I did notice that actually. That's some of the some of the formatting doesn't translate over quite correctly. So it's it it's a little bit of well, sorry, that's not what I'm supposed to do. There's a little bit of work that needs to be done in, in terms of, of of getting it in the correct formatting. So for instance, uh, if I open this in MuseScore, MuseScore. I mean, this is the newest homework, and it should highlight the same kind of issue. By the way, nice background. Uh, it looks so familiar. Uh, restore yeah, session. <laughs> uh, okay. So this is homework two, part one. And as you can see, this already looks a little bit uh, different. Like, I mean, it's, it's there. The, the problem really is the headings collide and are kind of in different places. So yeah, if you guys, yeah, it was still doable. Like, there's no problem really, but like, it was just a, uh, it was just a little bit confusing, if you know what I mean. Sure, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because some of these, yeah, some of this stuff is on a di different system than I actually placed it. So, for instance, the way I, yeah, I don't know how to do this on MuseScore, but there's a way. The, the thing I do in Sibelius, which is <laughs> like basically do this, putting things in on new systems, 
I have I, I kind of have a deliberate arrangement of that. So in this MuScore file, it it kind of doesn't pay attention to that to some degree for whatever reason. It might have been. Well, I think it's because I didn't explicitly uh, like declare a system break every single time. I just saw that it worked, and sometimes it just it just by happy accident. Like, so what what I'm getting at is this little symbol right here. I have to like kind of create a system break to use to create a system break, but sometimes it just happens automatically, and I don't have to. I don't think I forget that it's not going to translate to other applications unless I explicitly do that. So over here, that's one of those cases where, like, you can see over here, I put a little system break, but over here, I, I guess I didn't. Um, so that's something that I can work on, and maybe that'll fix the problem. Um, I'm hoping. I, I just have to check. Like, over here, I put system breaks here and here and here. If I didn't, all these would collide with each other. Um, yeah, and I don't know how this would render. So I don't know how. Did you? What did you do? Did you just type stuff like this? Okay, so no, it it was it was a kind of a nightmare. I mean, because you have to, so you have to like put in, you have to click to click every. Well, I probably did it like the wrong way, the the more the long way, but I had to like make a new text for every like single thing I wrote to make it like look like a you know right. So it kind of took a while just to do that itself. Oh. So I, you know, I had to like click the note, and then if you. If you press, if you click a note, you press Command T. It like allows you to write, uh, you know, something, something down. Oh, I see. Yeah. So you okay. and I just, I just did a new, new text box for every single uh, solfege and uh, interval. Inter interval. Yeah. So there actually is, there is, uh, there's one other way you could do that. Um, there's two ways you could do that. If you press Command L. It'll actually create a lyric stat, and then you can type. You can just press space to advance. Uh, oh, I wish I knew that. <laughs> but it doesn't. It doesn't work completely from the standpoint that you have to put letters and you have to put solfege. So you'd still have to do the stupid command T thing, and then you'd have to like do it like that. But the other thing that I do actually in my when I'm giving the answer keys to the TAs is that I just I just use the same text box. And I just do this. Oh, that that could be a lot easier. Also, I was just wondering how you do the intervals on. I was I was having some trouble with that also. Like oh, the, the, uh, the the Roman the Roman like and like writing you know like three four, or, uh you know set I, I I don't know, like. Oh the oh the the time stick like what do you the the, time, the oh 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 I see the figure of base uh, yeah that's a good question um so let, let me open up the other document and see if I can elucidate that a little bit. I can actually answer that. So under use course like command, I forgot which option, but like there's a command that says uh, Roman numeral human Roman numeral analysis. By default it doesn't have any like uh, shortcuts built in, but you can actually put a shortcut on Roman numeral analysis and then do your figured base from there. Okay, gotcha. So uh, yeah, I think I think the shortcuts are in preferences. So so uh, it's so loud outside. There's some landscaping going on. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I'm like up in my grill right now. Um, so sorry. Yeah, so I guess if you go to keyboard preferences and you go to shortcuts, um, Roman numeral analysis, or I guess you could search, add Roman numeral analysis. So I guess, uh, oh, who was the who was the person? What's the person's name who said that comment? Uh, that was me. What's your, what is your name again? Uh, Gabriel. Oh, Gabriel Agnot, Ag Agnot, I think, or something. Um, great. Uh, add Roman numeral analysis. So you could. Um, I guess what did you do from here? Did you change the? You, you, you created a new shortcut. Um, I just mapped it to like Control H, and then like every time I would like try to name chords, I would just like I would click the chord and then just uh, Control H. That's what I would do. Yeah, yeah. So there, that is that is one way you could do it. The other way you could do it, which is less pretty. 
Um, well, actually, I'd recommend doing the pretty way of actually using the official Roman numeral syntax. But sometimes, if you want to be less pretty, you could you could create a lyric text and you could do something like six. You could you could you could do something like that. That's exactly what I did. That's what you did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not as pretty, but it's um, it communicates enough in like a standard text format. Um, yeah, and if you use the lyrics notation, then you can also, like before, you can just space bar to advance to the next chord, which is convenient. Um, but yeah, if you are interested in educational, I think I think you might have, you, some, I've been getting emails, but if you, you are interested in educational copy, I can totally help you, up with, help you up with the install. Yeah, I emailed you, but you never responded. Uh, I knew I was forgetting someone, but um, We'll make sure we'll make sure you get set up. Maybe during even during the beginning of office hours or something, we can do that. Um, and when are office start. hours? It's right after class. Oh, okay, sweet. Yeah, yeah. It's it's I helped someone else uh, last class with it, so we can definitely get you set up, and situated. And if anyone else is interested, they can see how it's done. Are you on Windows or Mac? Mac. Oh yeah. Okay. Great. So that'll be the yeah. That'll be great and educational for people. Okay. All right. Well, wonderful. We'll definitely do that. Um, okay. Sorry, I was I was up to like almost 5 a.m. last night, so I'm pretty tired right now. But uh, it was for the sake of this class. I just want to say I, I I was I got really obsessed with adding stuff. So I guess one of the things about the new homework, I'm gonna open it up in Sibelius now, uh, is <clears throat> the following. There are more chords that you're expected to do. Analysis than you were previously. Oh, whoops. So for instance, sorry, I can't just go to uh, the one note. I actually have to open it up now. Uh, okay, homework two, questions, files, part one. Okay. Okay. So one of the components of the homework is I'm going to ask you to draw these other chords, like an F7 sus4 chord or a B add 2 or a D7 9. Oh, look at that. This is on my Sibelius file. I'm sorry. Wait, wait a second. Give me one sec. Uh, geez. Uh, oh, OK. Sorry. Keep, keep me. Sorry, guys. Sorry, I have so many files now that I'm, I'm clicking the wrong ones. Okay. Yeah. Oh, gosh, that's... I don't like... There's something about this that I don't like. I don't like how that was there. Um... <laughs> Everything looks totally different right now for whatever reason. You know what? Give me one sec. I can I could just do this. Okay, yeah. I don't know why it looks fine here, but it doesn't look fine there. I got nervous for a second because those were actually the ant yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, so you're gonna see different chords like this. You're gonna see uh, nine chords, sus four chords, half diminished chords, um, add two chords. You know, this idea of continuing adding 9, sharp 11, and 13s. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting stuff that you're going to learn or need to know. And I'll kind of explain some of that to you right now. So if you go to the OneNote and you go to the chord section, and you go to the jazz chord section, I've kind of tried to explain to you, elaborate what I told you last time, and try to clean it up because it became this huge thing. Like it's. It's so ridiculous to expect a mastery of jazz chords like I got in, in such a short time, let alone like the way that many people treat it where they're like, hey, it's like it's almost like the expectation is like, hey, master jazz in a week. 
Uh, there's so many things that you could know and, and, and not that you could forget. So I, I got really obsessed with this and I tried to be as clear as I could because there's, there are confusing aspects of, of jazz chords. Like once you exceed, so this is what I really call a jazz chord. It's when the closed voiced root position form, which is something that you know by now, the snowman, incorporates intervals greater than a seventh. So for instance, this chord right here, you know, it has these chord tones constitute thirds, fifths, sevenths, but then you see these notes up here and they constitute nines, ninths, elevenths, thirteenths. And with these chords, right, with these intervals right here, you can get, you can get your tickets to jazz land with these jazzy intervals. Yeah, it was really late. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, anyway, when analyzing the intervals of a jazz chord, you have to analyze all the notes of the chord in terms of the notes of the major scale built on the root of the chord, which is circled in orange. So essentially, you have to analyze all these tones in terms of a major scale built on the root of this chord, which is this chord right here, okay? Which is circled in orange, which is this note right here, which is circled in orange, okay? So here are actually two octaves of a major scale built on the root of the chord above, okay? So if you, if you build a major scale centered around this orange note and you draw two octaves worth of it, this is what you get, okay? So all the blue notes actually make up every single note of a C major scale, but they just span two octaves, okay? So with that being said, you can actually compare every single note in this chord against every single scale degree of the major scale. And that's essentially what is blueified in this diagram, okay? So you see in this chord, you see the first of the major scale, you see the third of the major scale, you see the fifth of the major scale, you see the seventh of the major scale, you see the ninth of the major scale, you see the 11th of the major scale, you see the 13th of the major scale, and actually I didn't include the 15th, but the 15th is really the same as two octaves above the starting pitch, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, no questions. Um, I have a question. Sure. So you say that it's built on the major chord of the, um, the root note. So yesterday in section, we were talking about how there's like, sometimes we're talking about it in terms of like a dominant chord or minor chord. So even if the seventh with just like the four notes is made to be like a dominant or minor chord, we still base it off the, the notes, like the numbering of the notes off the major chord of that root note. Yeah, we, it, yeah, exactly. We base it off the, the major scale built off the root note. Okay. And so that's, that's really like a distinction that classical musicians, uh, I mean, that, that differentiates jazz naming from classical naming in some ways. Okay. So for instance, if it's a dominant seventh, a jazz person would quantify this interval as a flat seventh instead of, a seventh. I mean, no, this is, this currently this is correct, but I mean, there's an example right here, which shows that. Okay. So here's a, here, well, actually here's a minor seventh chord. This is the underlying seventh chord for this, in this example. And the scale degrees here are, uh, I mean, the, the uh, intervals that these chord tones make up are, uh, are different than the intervals that these chord tones make up. From the standpoint that related, these, these chord tones related to a major scale are actually uh, modified. So for instance, this is the same major scale drawing as before, except now it, uh, the third is flatted, uh, the seventh is flatted, I guess the tenth is also flatted, but that's really just saying that the third was flatted, if, you know? Oh, yeah. The, the 11th is flatted. I mean, the 11th is sharped, I should say. And the 14th is, I guess, flatted because the, the third is flatted. This will, I mean, sorry, the 14th is flatted because the seventh was flatted. So then would you write that then as like C major, um, like three flat, seven flat, 11 sharp? Ah, so that's a good question. So how would you name this? Why, why was the fourth not sharp? Uh, why was the fourth note uh, sharped over here? Why was it not? That's Isn't a great. The, the F that's, sharp. 
or the F is natural here. Yeah, I, I guess you could say that the fourth should be sharped as well. That's sometimes I should say this, that sometimes the, the, the notes in the lower octave could have a different uh, modification than the notes in the upper octave. But in this case, absolutely, you would, it's a sharp four. But you would call it, when you're actually naming the jazz chord, you would call it, a, you would call this extension a sharp 11. But good catch. That's something that will be here. Your contribution is immortalized on this one note. All right, great. So now naming jazz chords. So Tate, to go, go to your question from before. I want to kind of recap how you would name jazz chords, which I talked about last time. So there's two parts in naming a jazz chord, and that is the notes making up the underlying seventh chord, which are underlined. That component in like in an actual uh, jazz chord is underlined in red over here. And then the notes which underline, which constitute the extension are underlined in blue. And similarly, I, in this diagram, where uh, the notes are bracketed in red, which, which constitute the underlying seventh chord, and then the extensions are bracketed in blue. And remember from before, we're in jazz land or extension land when we're dealing with the extension. So the blue notes, you know, well, in this particular case, the, the, the notes that are boxed in blue are the extensions. And those are precisely the notes that we are concerned with when we're talking about the second part, which, which are describing the extensions. So yeah, again, there's two parts. You have to describe the notes that make up the underlying seventh chord, and then you also have to describe the notes which constitute the extensions. So going back to, oh, go ahead, Tate. All right, so the, the one under G flat major is like saying it's A flat seven with a sharp nine. Or so, dominant seven. Yeah, it's a dominant seven with a sharp nine scale degree, exactly. And then this one right here is a G flat major seven with a sharp 11. And that okay. actually. Sorry, uh, we, we learned in section the other day too that it seemed like you could only write it with the, the topmost degree so like if it was just like the 13th and the 11th and 9th and you just write whatever it is 13th i'm gonna get to that actually i have i have a slide about that okay but that's a good that's a good question um there is there is some implicit stuff that you can derive so that's actually a, a very good question um but I guess if we're going to, if we're going to strive, if we're trying to name a jazz chord in, in a more vanilla way, in a, in a very explicit way, where you kind of have the underlying seventh chord here and you have the extensions here, uh, this is the process for doing that. So let's consider the first chord from before, where you have the root, the third, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth, the eleventh, and the thirteenth. I've actually determined that these are those intervals by drawing a major scale next to it. And then determining that indeed it, it is true that the first note of the major scale is the first note of this chord, the third note of the major scale is the second note of this chord, the fifth note of the major scale is the third note of this chord, etc. They all compute. There's no there's no disagreement between the major scale and, and this. So what you would do is the following. Considering, remember that when you're analyzing the intervals of the jazz chord, you have to analyze the notes in terms of the major scale, we already did that. So the red box notes can constitute the underlying seventh chord. Um, and so just by knowledge from your from from one B, and maybe even one A, you would know that these particular notes constitute a major seventh chord, correct? Because what you see here essentially is a major third, a minor third, and then you see a major third. Um, so actually, if that if if you need a refresher on that, there's a refresher on that right here. So like the underlying seventh chords, if you go to the seventh chord section of the one note, you can actually see all of the under, underlying seventh chord definitions. Like these are the seventh chords. There's a dominant seventh, which can be represented without anything after it. A major seventh, which can be represented with this delta symbol or a major, right? These are the different intervallic formulas, but for a dominant seventh, we're dealing with a major third. Um, sorry, give me a second. We're dealing with a major third underneath a minor third, underneath a minor third. And that's what the formula for a dominant seventh is. So getting back to this slide right here, what you have is you have 
a major third underneath a minor third underneath a major third. No. So that formula is actually a major seventh, right? That's just it is. That's just what it is. Okay. That's the first part of our analysis. That's like this underlying component right here. Okay. Now the blue box notes constitute the extensions. So that's a ninth, an eleventh, and a thirteenth. Okay. So now the final answer in, in the most explicit terms is that this is a C major seven, and you can see that I underlined it in red, and then a nine, 11, and a 13, which is underlined in blue. Does that make sense? Hopefully, right? Um, okay, let's consider the second example from before. Okay, so what we have is a dominance. Okay, so let's do the same exact thing we did before, which was we kind of have these block boxed blue notes, which are the extensions. And then you have the, this underlying seventh chord, which are uh, basically, which constitute the, the, the chord, the seventh chord itself. Um, so we have to do the same sort of analysis. You have to take this chord and you have to take the root note of the chord and you have to build a major scale on it. And then you have to kind of compare the notes of the major scale against all of these chord tones. And I've actually modified them on the major scale itself. So what we have is, well, the first note is correct. The second note is, well, well, we're not concerned with it. Well, actually it isn't modified because the ninth isn't modified. Incidentally, the second is the same thing as the ninth, just an octave lower. Uh, if you're trying to find the octave of, of, of an interval, I mean, if you're trying to find the same note in an octave above, you just add seven to it. And then you find that the second is the same thing as the ninth, the third is the same thing as the 10th, et cetera. Okay. Well, anyway, um, what I was saying basically is that you find that in terms of a major scale, this second note in this chord is actually flatted. So this chord actually has a flat third, right? Compared to the major scale, this fourth note of the chord is actually flatted in the major scale. It's actually a flat seventh. Are you following along? And compared to a major scale, this sixth note of the chord uh, is actually a sharp 11 or a sharp four. If, you know, if I get back to, sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't show me your names. On, on, on this platform, but I know I'm, I'm looking at your face right now, and, and the man who, who made the contribution, who noticed this discrepancy earlier. Miguel. Miguel, Miguel say hi. As, as soon as you speak, it shows your name. Great. Um, awesome. Yeah, so this should be sharp four as well. So are we only looking at the notes from the scale that overlap with the notes from the blues scale? Is that what we're doing? No, no, we're, we're, overla we're looking at the notes of this, of this chord compared to the notes of a major scale built on a root of, of, of built on this chord root. So essentially, okay, yeah, yeah, the, chord. The, major, the major scale is this. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. It's just unmodified. This is how you would represent scale degrees of the major scale. You would just write one, two, third, et cetera, right? But right here, a flat third doesn't exist in a major scale. So that's why I wrote flat third, because this isn't, what I'm drawing here is actually not a major scale. I'm actually drawing the modified, the modified major scale. So maybe, maybe that makes it a little clearer, right? So this is the modified major scale versus this is the, this is the major scale. Oh geez, I don't like how it just created space right there because that means everything else gets shifted and all my boxes get offset. Okay, so this is the unmodified major scale. And somehow this got deleted. This is the modified. A modified major scale got modified. This is the modified major scale. All right. So, um, great. Hey, by the way, um, I guess I should say this. Connor, your video is upside down. Let's see. Um, 
All right, great. Sorry, it's throwing me off a little bit. There's, it's, uh, anyway, very good. Let's see what else we can do. All right, great. <laughs> okay. All right, sorry. It's, I'm still waking up, so all this stuff is like, you know, whether it be the landscaping or upside down people or me opening up the wrong version of a file. It's wrong, it, you know, but now, now I'm getting the zone. There's nothing like jazz music to kind of just wake you up. All right. So anyway, if we were trying to analyze this chord from before, what we get is a similar process. So basically we have uh, the underlying seventh chord is going to be a minor seventh chord. And that's by virtue of the fact that it's a minor third interval underneath a major third interval underneath a minor third interval. So great. So that's a minor seventh chord. Great, but that we're not done yet. We, ha we have to actually describe these extensions right here. So these extensions right here are a nine, a sharp 11, and a 13. So what you have is a C minor seven, parentheses, nine, sharp 11, 13. That's the most vanilla, most clear, non-ambiguous way to describe this chord. And that's exactly the way I presented this to you for your homework so that you're not pulling out your, your, your hair. But with that being said, um, I just want to expose to you an ambiguous way that you'll kind of see chord symbols represented. Um, sometimes the underlying seventh chords are not explicitly given. So you might see a chord like B13 or B major 13, okay? But the underlying seventh chord is actually really easy to find. And this is, this is, this is, the, this is how you find it. If you don't see anything between the root and the, like the extensions, that means the quality is a dominant, okay? This is really the challenge. It's, the first challenge is what is the quality of this underlying seventh chord? Then you can actually get on with your work, right? So if you don't see anything here, like I'm zooming in, I'm going in deep guys. And uh, as I zoom in, I'm not actually zooming in where I wanna zoom in, unfortunately. Uh, but I was trying to zoom in here. I can't do that. Like you can't see what I'm doing. I'm trying to do that old fancy zoom in trick, but I don't think you can see me zoom in, uh, using that obnoxious sort of screen zoom in, but, uh, I, I'm trying to be equally obnoxious using other methods, but I can't do it right now. So anyway, this right here is, uh, there's nothing here between this B and this 13, which means that this is a dominant quality chord. Okay. So this is kind of going along with Tate's question of, of what do you do when you, when you see chords like this? And so in this situation, you see a little minus sign between the root and the extension. And the quality of this chord is a minor seventh. In this particular case, you see a major, or you might see a little delta, a little triangle, uh, but uh, that's, that's another way of, of what you could see. Um, I, I don't know how to draw it. I can pull it up right here and see if I find one quickly. You might see this, this little triangle symbol. And uh, what that means is that the underlying seventh chord is a major seventh chord, okay? There are, all, there are actually more. There's like diminished and half diminished. I forgot to include those. It's, it's, you know, you can imagine that if you just had a diminished symbol here or a half diminished symbol here, it would be the same sort of situation, right? But regardless, sorry, regardless of what it, the underlying seventh chord is, you, you base it off the major, like the numbering off the major chord, right? So even if it's B minor 13, like, or B minor, then you still base the rest of the extension notes off of the B major scale. Precisely. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So now here, here is the, uh, here's the other part of the coin. So you, you, we talked about the underlying seventh chords, but actually, in a real jazz context, um, if you saw something like this, implicit in this notation is that you would play the ninth and 11th. You could play the ninth and 11th as well. And there are certain assumptions about which ninths and which 11ths you can play. Um, I won't get into that. This is why I'm not actually asking you to solve homework problems like this, but eventually I might have get you get you on into that. But I think that there's a lot to talk about today and I wanna confuse you. I want. I have. I mean, I have a question. Sure. Um, so it, let's just say the ninth is sharp, 
and it's a 13th one. Uh-huh. Um, is Do we just put sharp nine and then a 13? Exactly. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much. My mom just brought me a smoothie. How, how could you beat that? Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, if, if you see a 13, uh, you'd also see a sharp nine. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Yeah, you'd, see, you'd, see a, you'd see a sharp nine as well, because you couldn't just say, uh, you couldn't, um, the sharp nine wouldn't be assumed because the assumption, I guess, would be that the nine wouldn't be sharp. So you actually have to put like sharp nine. Um, I will say that that is not always true. There are certain assumptions about certain chord qualities, like certain chord qualities have, there's an assumption, for instance, in a major seventh that the 11 is sharped, but we won't get into that. Um, but yes, if you wanted to actually explicitly say in the most clear way possible, you could say C minor 13, sharp nine, and that would be totally acceptable. But, okay, anyway, um, hopefully this all makes sense. We can actually do an example of this. Um, Can I do a question, Nicole? Yeah, absolutely. If you're trying to find what the note is for like, you know, like C major, like 13 or something, is the best way you think to do that, um, just to like subtract seven from the 13, and then you know that it's uh, a five or a A six. Yeah, a six. Is that probably the fastest way to do it? Honestly, that's the way I kind of do it. I kind of, I kind of have an association in my mind of, of six, 13 being a six an octave above, 11 being a four above, and nine being a two above. So that's a great uh, way of thinking about it. Uh, yeah, it, it, the octave transpose of the, of the interval. Um, so that's a good thing to kind of, uh, <clears throat> that's a good thing to actually jot down somewhere. I don't know where I'd put this now that I've actually put have a, have, a, have a theme going on here. Um, I'll, I'll just write that down and I'll figure out where to put it later. Um, second equals ninth. Uh, what's the other one? Fourth equals 11th. Uh, I guess I should write this the other way around. So for instance, oh, my mouse is being slow right now. Ninth equals second. Uh, I lost the bullet point. 11th equals 4th, and 13th equals 6th. Basically, what's going on here is that subtract 7. And you get the same interval in a different octave. OK? Great. Okay, so I guess we could we could actually do an example of this. Um, I restarted Sibelius, but it doesn't matter. We can do this on a, on a blank. Oh, you shouldn't see that. Uh, let's see. Okay. So let's say I give you. Hmm. Let's do this. Actually, let's look at one of our an example of a homework problem I'd give you, which could be something like this. If I asked you to do something like C7, 9 sharp 11, this is sort of the inverse way of doing it. How would you, well, let's, have, let's figure out how we do this. So I guess the first question you might have to think about is what is the underlying seventh here? C dominant, C dominant C dominant set exactly. So in that case, just to go down trip down memory lane, so you'd have Apple, sure. Also, that sharp after the nine is that a mistake? Oh, that's a mistake. Yes, thank you for catching that. All right. So the underlying seventh chord is going to be well. To make a dominant chord, you have to create a major third, and then you create a minor third, and then you create. Oh, doesn't like that. Then you create another minor third above it. Oh, interestingly, I just discovered a feature uh, last night. I don't know, 4 a.m. or something, which is, I think you'll enjoy this feature. I figured out I can remove the playback line so it doesn't get in the way. All right, great. So right here, this is now a dominant seven, which is pretty awesome already. But it doesn't stop, the, the, the joy doesn't stop there. Let's see what's in the chat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, the problem the problem with this this quarantine schedule is that I take like I take a nap sometimes in the middle of the day, and then that's just a that's just basically a death sentence for your sleep schedule. So I took like an hour nap in the middle of the day or two hours, and it it ruined me. But I yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah, I think everyone's in the in the in on the same page in that regard. So someone asked, is Theta Music part of the homework? Theta Music is part of the extra credit. And actually, I've raised the threshold for how much, how many extra credit points you have, how many points you need on Theta Music in order to get extra credit. I've raised it from 5,000 to 100,000. No, actually, no, to 500,000. Um, because I realized that was an order of magnitude off in how difficult it is to earn points on Theta Music. Because really, if, if you guys did the extra credit on Theta Music last quarter, you would have just had to play two games to get 5% extra credit. That's like five minutes of your time to increase your grade 5%. So that was a definite decimal uh, place error in my calculation. So this time you'll have to get 500,000 points, which you know might take four hours, but you get 5% extra credit. And it's actually pretty fun and it's, it's kind of scaled. So if you get like 100,000, you get, 1% extra credit. So, and someone definitely, someone got 100,000 last quarter. Yeah, 500,000, it's over 500,000. That's, uh, I mean, if we're, if we're computing this in terms of uh, Dragon Ball Z power levels, that's about, uh, you know, half of, half of Frieza's power level. Uh, it's a lot, it's a lot of, it's a lot of power and, power and points, but, um, but I think you guys can do it, and I can get a sense for how you guys are doing as time goes by. And actually, I, I emailed all the TAs asking them to create accounts for you because I can't create accounts for you from the standpoint. Oh yeah, the reason you can't access your Theta Music account chain is that I can't actually create accounts for you until the TAs create accounts for you. The, the from the rationale that if I create accounts for you, the TAs can't see your progress, but if the TAs create accounts for you, I can see their accounts because I'm like the administrator. Um, so I, e I emailed them last night, and everyone in the Gel section has access, but the other TAs haven't uh, haven't done that yet. So I, I chastised them and threatened them. Uh, no, I, I didn't really. I just told them to do it. Um, and they should give you access, and then you could you could start your your journey towards 500,000 extra credit points, which translate to 5% of your grade. Okay. Um, sorry. By the way. I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep this chat over here. It's hard for me to open the chat and close close it. But if you have a question that's really salient, just just chat in and just just uh, talk and it'll it'll be good. Or I could look at the chat. It's okay. It's okay either way. I have another question actually. Sure. Um, so can you construct like an add nine or add eleven et cetera chord on a triad foundation? And would you still use the same convention? Um, so give me an example of a chord symbol. Like what? What would you? What would you type for? What? What? Do you, what would the chord be? A C add nine? Yeah, because like um, you could do like a C seven add nine or like C add nine, but I guess we just we skip the triad notation and we just assume that's a seventh as the foundation. Ah, okay. So this is actually a really good point that you made. Um, and I have I have a slide for it, but I haven't gotten there yet. And actually, what you just asked me wasn't on my slides, so um, I will explain that. I will definitely explain that in a in a in a moment. That'll be the next thing I explain. Um, okay, so if we're trying to analyze this C7, not, or sorry, if we're trying to actually notate the C7, 9, sharp, 11, 13, one of the things we can do is just draw a handy dandy major scale. Ah, so much glee in that major scale. Okay, great. But I wanna, I wanna, inc I wanna include two octaves worth. <clears throat> so I'm gonna do this, okay, awesome. And so, you know, intervallically, this would be the first, this would be two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, oh gosh, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Guys, I learned how to count last night. All right, great. So I have all these, uh, these intervals right here. And now this is how the intervals would look in a vanilla major scale. But if I were to actually um, modify these intervals, like for instance, this 11 needs to be sharped. Also be sharp to four to, to reflect it. Then all of a sudden, look at that. So now this is the task I have. Oh, but I have to explicitly say that that's what I did. Sharp 11, sharp four, right? This is the only difference. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, there's another difference. 
right? Compared, I mean, compared to a major scale, the seventh, the, the chord interval of a seventh is actually flatted compared to a major scale. So I just put that in here as well. So now what I could do is I have the underlying seventh chord, which perfectly matches with, with per, which perfectly matches with, right? These two things match. Great, that's step one. Step two is matching these upper tensions, which can be the nine, the sharp 11, and the 13. So I just have to put that over there. Oh gosh, I didn't like that. That, there it is. Uh, no, yeah, there it is. So that's how I would write that chord out. It's basically, this is the underlying seventh chord, which is a dominant chord. And then this is the, uh, these are the upper extensions, which are modified, like one of the notes, the sharp 11 is modified compared to a major scale. So that is how you do that. Let's try another example. Any questions about that? Okay, let's get back, get back to our vanilla scale really quickly. Okay, now, um, okay, let's try a different chord. Someone, someone, someone give me a chord, all right? Someone from the peanut gallery, just, just think of, think of a chord. A flat minor. What, what was, what was that? I couldn't hear you very well. A flat minor. Oh man, you gotta give me something more juicy than that. I mean that's good. That's a good start. A flat minor seven. Let's let's start with that, and then give me some extensions. B flat minor, or G flat major actually. Uh, well, no, we'll we'll stick with A flat minor because that. But but what what's an extension? What what are some extensions I should add to this? Fifteen. Fifteen. Well, well, fifteen is actually the same as the root. So think. So so give me one, either a nine, eleven, or thirteen. Natural or, eleven. Natural eleven. So you want eleven? Cool. Perfect. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, instead of having a C major scale, I'm gonna have an A flat major scale. Oh gosh. Fun, right? So now these scale degrees are still valid, but we're, we're talking about an A flat major scale because remember, we're trying to compare um, <clears throat> the root of this chord against a major scale built on the root. Okay, so an A flat minor seven, well, that's pretty straightforward. We need a, we need an inter, we need a starting note, which is A flat, then we need to build a minor third on top of that. So I'm gonna build a minor third and I'm gonna, there we go. And then I'm gonna need another note. I'm gonna need a major third above that. Whoops, Not that, okay. And now I need a minor third above that. That's a major third, make it a minor third, great. So that is the underlying seventh chord. And actually, if I were to modify this, let me first, sorry, I have to move your zoom window out of the way. <clears throat> Gosh, it's, it doesn't like me. Let me move this out of the way and let me do that. Okay, great. So just already the difference between the major scale and what we just did, I should just probably document that. So the third is flat, the seven is flat, all right? Correspondingly, annoyingly, the 10 is also flat and the 14 is also flat. All right. But the 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 is unmodified, right? It didn't, no one told me sharp 11, no one told me flat 11, right? It's just 11, which means that the only thing we have to do here is we just have to add, well, let's actually, let's just actually continue the format. I always do, I always include all extensions leading up to the final extension and so far in the homework. So let's say we have a nine and 11. Well, the nine is unmodified, right? It's just a nine. Then we have an 11. So what we have to do basically is we just have to take this nine pitch and we have to take this 11 pitch. Ooh, that's not right. 
to make it match. And the 11. Ooh, look at that. Can you hear this? Yeah. That is a great, great jazz chord. I love that chord. It's so great. Um, yes. Used in like lo-fi hip hop and, and that sort of genre. Um, it's a it's a wonderful chord to add to your arsenal. So natural 11th doesn't mean that the D would be natural? No. Oh, no, no. I see what you're saying. Um, you wouldn't use ever use the syntax natural 11 from the standpoint that the 11 is already natural in a major scale. Correct? Right? The 11 is already unmodified. Like, like it's just uh, like in any scale, all of the scale degrees are natural. Like, for instance, if I went back here and I did this in C major, uh, and I did this and I did this, uh, whoops, it wants to play that for whatever reason. And I did this, uh, sorry, give me a second here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I could also do not one, not two, right? It would be the same exact thing, right? There'd be no difference. Um, because these scale degrees, in the context of a major scale, they're already natural, like they're the natural scale degrees, right? They're unmodified. So if you wanted to say natural 11, like in this key, if you wanted to flat it, for instance, you'd have to say flat 11, right? Because natural 11 doesn't have any meaning. But flat 11, sharp 11 does have meaning. So for instance, if I did natural 11, it would be, well, not, sorry, if I did flat 11, I would actually have to take this note and actually have to turn the flat into a double flat. So now we're basically flat 11, which actually happens to be D double flat, right? That's a little confusing, but that's true, right? The four, incidentally, is also flat. So the, the fourth scale degree is flat, which means that in the key of A flat major, that's D double flat. OK? So this chord, oh, it doesn't sound as cool. Um, what can you do? OK, does that make sense, guys? I know that's, I, I just want to make, because this is something that I'm going to continue to give you over the course of the quarter. Like this is going to be a component of your homework. It's going to be interspersed with the other aspects of the, your, like the other aspects of, of taking a traditional seventh chord and inverting it. And who knows, maybe we'll get to the point where, I, where I'll actually ask you to invert these chords, but it's not as straightforward. But truth be told, when you invert these chords, uh, let, me, let me find my piano pedal. I kicked it under my desk. Here it is. So if you invert these chords in different ways, you actually get a lot of richness. Like if you leave these chords in vanilla root position, you get, you get something that sounds very characteristic of like lo-fi hip hop. And it's very cool sounding, but if you invert these chords, you can actually get all kinds of interesting things. So, but there's, again, this is, this is why the expectation to just like on the syllabus, they're like, hey, just cover, cover 9, 11, 13th chords in like week nine. It's a little ridiculous because there, it's like it, it, this genre is so complicated. Like it's it's an incredible genre. I have so much reverence for jazz, and that's why it's so difficult to to do this. So we're just going to continually kind of ease into this knowledge because there's, it's 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 a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff to know. Um, Sorry, on the on the homework, do you mind just showing the homework real quick for the sure. for the jazz chord? Part, what is what does it mean when it says like the three and the four at the bottom? Ah, uh, that just that was just for my edification and probably your edification to know how many notes there are in the chord, and that's basically how I tallied seventy five oh. notes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So it's just for my own sanity's sake. Okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, for now we're only dealing with closed voiced root position versions of jazz chords. 
Uh, in the real world, that doesn't always happen. We get, you get strange inversions and things like that. But ultimately, you can, in your own time, you can experiment with inverting these chords. And maybe I'll put that as part of a homework, a future homework assignment, OK? So Shane earlier talked about, um, OK. OK. Let's, let's skip the conversation on slash notation. Uh, and let's go on to sus chords, OK? Sus chords versus add chords, OK? So here's a sus chord. And it has a suspended sound. And generally, sus chords want to resolve to a snowman looking chord, right? Or you've heard, you've heard this song, right? Right? It goes to the sus four. It's actually a different inversion, the way it normally happens. But the sus, you don't, you, unless you're in like a more of a modal jazz context, you don't hear things like this. You usually hear something like this. OK, so let's play a little game. I'm going to play a chord. And every time I play a sus chord, I want you to raise your hand and do this. Okay. And okay. play a what chord? You cut every, off on my feed. Oh, every every time I play a sus chord, I want you to I want you to do this. All right. You got you guys got the gesture? All right, great. Yeah, exactly. You know? All right. in your life at some point. Uh, that's basically a sus chord resolving to a snowman chord. Does uh, it matter if the non-chord tone resolves upward or downward? Uh, no. Well, there's different applications. So for instance, here in this first resolution case, this resolved to the snowman, like this D resolved upwards. But in this situation, the C actually resolved downwards, and it made a first inversion triad. So a sus chord can resolve up and make a root position triad. It can resolve down. It can make first inversion triad. There are other possibilities for, for creating suspension and release. But this is what a sus, this is a C sus two chord. And uh, Sorry, sorry, go on. Sorry, my bad. No, no, no. Um, uh, curious to what you have to say, but I will just let me know if you if you think or if you want to say it. But here is a sus four chord, and now this is kind of re reminding me of what Shane was talking about earlier. And this applies to what this applies to sus chords and add two chords. So you might be in a situation. Notice how like when I call this a sus chord, I'm not calling this a C sus nine. I'm calling this a C sus two, right? And there's a distinction there. Because if I, if I, you know, there's a distinction between playing something as a two versus a nine. And what that is really, a sip of this juice. What that is really is that, um, how can I put this? I think I have it over here somewhere. Well, here, here's an important thing they kind of interact more with the triads in the lower octave. So for instance, this two interacts with this three by virtue that it, it wants to resolve to the three. It doesn't interact as a nine from the standpoint that it like, well, it doesn't have the same, it might not want to interact with the 10 necessarily. But when, it's, when, when you're writing it as a sus two, this two is interacting with the three. You want, you want to, okay, here's the most, Basic explanation. When you when you call it a sus two, you want it to be in the lower octave. You want it to sound like this versus like this. So that's like the first explanation I can give you. The second explanation I can give you is that when you're doing things in the lower octave, like when, when you're calling it a sus two, or I guess I, I'll explain it to you an add two chord right now. 
it gives you a platform for describing chords without using seventh chords. And I think this is kind of what Shane was, was asking earlier. So in this particular case, you can actually be like, hey, I don't want to have a seventh chord, but I want to put this second scale degree in the chord. How do I do that? Well, you could do it using this add notation. You could say C major add two, and then all of a sudden you could have this two here and you're not, you don't have to communicate this, um, this major seventh because you know, there's a difference between this sound and this sound, right? And uh, you know, an improvisational jazz musician would probably not concern himself with the difference so much and he'd freely substitute one chord with the other chord. But if you're trying to be really explicit and you're really like, hey man, I don't want this note in this chord. It's really bothering me that this major seventh is in this chord. Well, you could actually have a C major chord with an add two and you could explicitly notate it that way. Uh, same with the add nine. Right? Like, you know that song close to you? You guys know that song? Um, oh, it's a cool song by the Carpenters. Um, so in that particular arrangement, it doesn't actually do this. It actually does. It leaves out the seventh, I think. So in that case, I guess that's a candidate, I think, for a C major add nine. If you're trying to be like, hey, I don't want that. It's, it's making my chord too dense. I just want to exclude that note. So I have, a, I have some questions over here. Uh, after all, afterwards, can we go over how to write open position chords in figured bass? As I realized as I was doing the homework that I don't really know how. Ooh. Yes. So do we tell what its natural state is by building a major scale starting from the root note? Uh, yeah, exactly. You, you find the natural state by building a major scale starting from the root note. That's the natural state. You don't have to do any modifications. Uh, to get to that note. So based on the, uh, the questions of in the chat, Siddharth talked about writing open position chords in figured bass. I'll, I'll talk about that, but I'll also, I'll also go over that a little bit in office hours if you have some time, because I want to finish that, this explanation a little bit, because this might actually take 10 minutes, which um, there's a lot of stuff to cover. Um, but let's see what I can do. So a sus chord and an add two chord, they're both kind of interesting from the standpoint that they have this note in the chord that kind of makes it less snowman-like. In, in the case of the sus chord, the expectation is that it becomes a snowman um, through resolution. And you can see that, right? Like a C sus four chord, you can see how it's very close to this snowman or this inverted snowman. The C7 sus4, which is a dominant seventh chord with a, the fourth scale degree being raised from the third, you can see how the C7-4, right? that's a C7 sus4, which really wants to resolve to this, right? So this is, I think, helpful to think about sus chords in terms of the chords that they resolve to, and you can see where the term suspension comes from. It's like it's suspended in time. It really wants to, it wants to go there, right? An add two chord is a little bit more resolved feeling because it actually has the triad. This, you can see how these two are things are very similar, right? But in this case, this doesn't have a built-in snowman. Whereas right here, you have a built-in snowman. What'd you say? Are sus chords also, um like add four chords is that also a sus chord uh are sus chords also add four chords um no that is actually an add four chord by default okay so when you add something to a chord it the default expectation is that the triad is built there the triad is there so there's a built-in snowman already when you have a sus chord the snowman isn't built in but an add four chord i mean it's not a very common chord I would say, I think a sus4 chord is more often common, would be this. You'd start out with a snowman, like a C add four chord would be this. And then basically you add a four. Oh, sorry, I did it. Uh, that would be a, a, yeah, it would be this. Sounds nice, right? 
this is a this is an interesting case of how this sounds very good in this octave, but this sounds really bad in this octave. Whereas in this octave, it sounds nice, right? Um, sorry, the new Zoom update I think is adding some weird pops and clicks. Um, this isn't good because I bought stock in Zoom and uh, I'm not happy about it. But uh, anyway. Um, so we have a C add two, and you see that it's built in, uh, built in snowman, but then you add the second scale degree. Whereas the C sus two, there's no built in snowman. And the expectation is that it eventually resolves to a snowman. Meaning the sus two is sort of a modification on a triad. And the third scale degree becomes, is like substituted. Ooh, that's another way of thinking about it. Substituted, no. Um, substitution. Um, I'll have to figure out how to incorporate that one. Yeah, in this particular case, the third scale degree, degree is substituted by the fourth scale degree. But, and the same with the C sus two, the second scale degree is substituted, the third scale degree is substituted by the second scale degree. Okay, mm -hmm. that's enough of that analogy. Does but here, the um, identity of a sus score depend on how it's resolved? In some ways, yes. In some ways, that's kind of how it's, that's the historical implication of the chord. So um, that's how, I mean, at the end of the day, this is what it is. Like in, in very like black and white terms, this is what it looks like. But what I attempt to kind of show you here is the rationale as to why it looks like this and in, in case, in the hopes that it helps you remember it better. But like, this is really, these are true states. This is a true statement. A C sus four is this. A C sus two is this. A C seven sus four is this. So for right. example, the first chord could also be a G, G, G sus four, correct? Uh, the first chord could actually be a G sus four inverted. Absolutely. Um, it could be, but then you'd have to invert it. You'd have to, you'd have to use slash notation, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, <clears throat> nothing to do with the, uh, the Guns N' Roses guitarist slash, although he probably enjoys, appreciates that notation. It's his namesake. Um, so anyway, yeah. So th that's what that's what these chords are: sus two versus add two, where it seems more resolved. And you can have an, a C minor add two, for instance. You guys know this song? Whoops, sorry. Hello by Lionel Richie. Anyway, it starts out with this chord. Anyway, is it, is it me you're looking for? Anyway, sorry, it's too early for Lionel Richie right now. All right, great. So we have a C add two, a C minor add two. We've talked about this. The other chord that I want to talk about, which is kind of in the same boat as add two and sus chords is uh, our major sixth and minor sixth chords. And so this is a major six chord. Sounds nice, right? Uh, it's basically a major triad with an added sixth. And this is how you notate it, C6. It's not, confusingly, it's not a C major chord first inversion. If you see this notation, C6, what you should see, what you should interpret this as is a major chord with an added six. And, it, and, and again, the six is referring to the major scale that's built on the root of the chord. So it's just a major sixth. Here, you have uh, the same, you have an underlying minor triad, and then you have the sixth, and the sixth is referring to the major scale. So it's major six still. Interestingly, these can be inverted. So a C major sixth is actually the inversion of a, the first inversion of an A minor seven chord. So previously, I, I guess this gives you another opportunity for analysis. You could actually, on your homework, you'd be like, I'm not going to call this a C major sixth. I'm going to call this an A minor first inversion. Or inversely, you could call an A minor first inversion a C minor a C major sixth, right? Does this make sense? That's a lot of information, I know. That's what happens when you're expected to squeeze in jazz in a week, but we'll, we'll continue to talk about this. This is, originally I was going to talk about this week 10, and I was like, no, no, no. This, I'll talk about it like week two or week one, and then we can talk about it throughout the course of the quarter. 
because it's confusing. I have a question. Sure. Um, so what about the, the dominant uh, fifth of the, the major six chord? Would it be uh, would it be changed? Because like, you know how like a, a major seventh chord has like a dominant where the, the seventh is a major, but um, the underlying uh, chord is like a, a I mean, it, um, a major seventh is it has like a, a plus a major third. Um, and then on the fifth scale degree, it's plus a minor third instead. Yeah. Um, so you're saying that a, ma a major seventh chord is made up of a major third with a minor third, right? From the from the third scale degree to, to the fifth scale degree? Yes. So in this case, um, if it's a major sixth, are we going to have like a dominant sixth as, as well? Uh, a dominant six. I'm trying to understand. Um, if it's a major six, we can have a um, I don't actually understand your question um, because is it like is there a, 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 a C six like where it's like a, a C major chord plus a, a minor six? Oh, I see what you're saying. So that would be okay if you wanted to do that. If you want to do a C major with a minor six, you'd actually have to do this. Let's see. A good way to test if these symbols are canonical is just by typing it into your software. So, so if I type this into my software, let's see if it if it likes me if I do this. C flat six. Uh, no, that's not correct. I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. C minor flat six. Yeah, actually, it 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 is a canonical thing. Yeah, I guess that's what you'd call it. For instance, if you had instead of having this, which is just a C six. This would be a C major flat six, and you put you put the flat six in parentheses. You see how it's put in parentheses? That is to dis, that's to prevent you from accidentally thinking that this is a C flat six. So I can show that to you as well in case you're interested in torture. I, I get it. Thank you. Of course. So I won't actually show you that because I think it'll all confuse you. Um, great. Um, Sorry, Siddharth, we didn't get a chance to look through, but I, I'm around for office hours, and it's also on YouTube. Um, incidentally, if you haven't checked out the videos and uh, if you want to hit that like or subscribe button, there it is. Uh, here's my YouTube channel. I'm trying to trying to increase the content. It's funny, I've gotten like more views this like I've, yeah more watch minutes this week than I've ever gotten. So this is motivating me to actually like come summer or maybe before then to actually get my YouTube channel kind of kind of kind of rolling. So anyway, you can see all the stuff and you could skip through all the, the stuff of me being like really tired and then like me waking up and uh, or whatever, you know, you can you can look at everything. In fact, there's a cool feature in YouTube where you can actually um, look at transcriptions of what is being said. So you can actually like download a transcript if you go to a different website and you could be like, when did he say such and such? And you could you could see things that way as well. Um, I feel as though I was supposed to tell you something else, but I can't remember right now. Um, but I guess, um, I know some of you guys might have to go, but I guess I can explain to Siddharth what this, how you would do this thing right here, um, which is basically, how do you do this on the homework? I think that's what you were asking, right, Siddharth? Siddharth? Yeah, um, I just was not sure how to put all those things into figure base when they were in the open position. Oh, okay. So here's how you do that. So let's actually um, let us do this. Oh gosh. I ah, sorry. You shouldn't be seeing those things. Let me close those things that you shouldn't be seeing. All right. Um, <laughs> So let's 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 take a look. Um, all right. So so if I have something like this, and we're in C major, right? You have this. Is this like straightforward in terms of uh, well, how how would you analyze this? I guess. 
Um, so what I would do is I, I've just kind of been using the flipping trick you've told me. And so I can figure out the inversion really easily, mm -hmm. but I, when it comes to figure base, I'm just really confused. Cause I feel like it would have like really big numbers, like a nine in there and stuff like that. So that's Oh, really? I, yeah. Did I accidentally give you guys, oh my gosh, uh, there was something else I want to tell you about the homework, but I guess the TAs can tell you. If I put a nine in there, well, I guess you have the chops to analyze that now. But I don't think I put a nine. I don't think it was a ninth chord. I think just like based off of where the notes were on the stabs, um, just met because like when in figure base you, I guess the way I've been thinking of it is you have the distance from the bottom note to the top note, and then the bottom to the second from the top, and so on. Right? Is that uh -huh. correct? Uh, this uh, sorry. The interval. Use. Can you, can you say it, can you say that again? I, I I lost your I lost train of thought, but it was my okay. bad. Uh, no worries. So um, with figure base, the way I've always thought of it is that when you have a figure base, it always tells you the interval between the bottom note and the top note, followed by the bottom note and the second from the top, followed by. Oh, okay, okay. Here's the thing. Okay, so here uh -huh. here's where this whole okay. So Siddharth, this is where this this obnoxious acronym will come in handy. I think for you, if you remember that, uh, gosh, where is it? Closed positions. Okay. This thing, finding the closed voicing root position version of the chord. Oh, so do you always, so like, I guess my question is, do you always, when you have something in open position like that, would you just always first convert it to closed position and then write the figure base for that? Exactly. You have, you have no choice because figured base doesn't encode anything about position it only encodes inversion so it doesn't ah, have any okay yeah so like from a figure from a figured base perspective mm -hmm. these are all equivalent um like that's these are all the same things in figured base okay, and sounds good so you have to you have to do you have to convert it to this this fellow right here and that's how you mm -hmm. proceed let me quickly stop sharing and then i'll i'll stop the